Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here at our first education track at the 2015 AWS Summit here in San Francisco. My name's Curtis Bray, I'm a solutions architect. and My team helps uh, customers, um, government customers, education customers, leverage AWS within their organizations. And this is really an incredible time within the, the cloud computing market. I'm really excited to be here and share different ways that the cloud is transforming education. So today you're gonna hear some stories about how leading edge private companies like Instructure are leveraging AWS to innovate their product lines for the education market. You'll also hear about how top tier universities like Stanford University and University of Arizona are using AWS to innovate education by accelerating time to science and optimizing teaching and learning experiences and streamlining administrative functions. So AWS is focused on local, regional, and central governments globally. All areas of education, K through 12, uh, higher education, both private and public, and educational technology companies that deliver and build tools and solutions for education and also not-for-profit organizations. So these customers are both thinking big and going big for a disruptive change with AWS. And we now have over 900 government organizations, over 3,400 educational organizations, and 1,100 not-for-profits that are running on AWS. We expect that to continue, and we like to, we're, we're gonna see that number in, in increasing over time. So you may have heard this morning at Andy Jassy's keynote um, about a number of new products and services that we released. So we continue to innovate on the platform at a very rapid pace. So customers benefit from, from this continual innovation and evolution because they can get those newest features and enhancements instantly. Right? They, have, they have no need to upgrade or deploy or, or migrate to take advantage of those. So this is really game changing when you think about it for, for our customers' abilities to deliver new value to teachers and researchers and, and students. So adoption of AWS by education is, it continues to grow, both with higher education um, techno and technology companies. Our education customers often indicate that the, the speed and flexibility and the cost effectiveness of AWS helps them stay agile to their users' needs, and helps them build on, on the reliable, secure, and scalable infrastructure of AWS. So you might have questions about security in the cloud, but our, our biggest customers and our most conservative customers have of, often found that we're able to meet, their, their, meet or exceed their security requirements, and we can often provide better security profile than what they had internally. The AWS cloud infrastructure has been designed and managed in alignment with various regulations and standards and best practices, including HIPAA and ISO 27001. So if you need to run HIPAA workloads or if you have ITAR compliant data, please contact us and we'll help you with the solution that meets those requirements. So as an example of, of services and features that we provide to enable security within AWS is AWS CloudTrail. So it's a web service that records the uh, AWS APIs, calls that are made in your account, and then delivers those as log files to you. So the, that API call history then produced by CloudTrail can then be used for security analysis, um, res resource change tracking, and compliance auditing. So research can't afford to be slow these days, right? In my experience as an IT leader in a large university, it could take weeks or even months to get provision a new server for a workload, right? So in the cloud, you can spin up thousands of servers in minutes and experiment very quickly. So if that experiment doesn't work out, you can simply spin those down and then you can stop paying for those instances. 
So it's a big, a big difference from the old world, right? In the cloud, you can instantly spin up and down HPC clusters. You can launch new production or dev environments very quickly. Importantly, you can then size your environments based on demand, such as when you have a large rush of student enrollment at the beginning of every term. Right? So everything changes with this kind of agility. So we see our customers doing amazing things when they can reduce the cost of experimentation. So it moves IT from being a roadblock, where each idea costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time, to really being an enabler where you can launch speculative projects very quickly. It allows our education technology companies, our educators, and our researchers to take more chances, and it gives them a shot at making breakthroughs as opposed to being scared to even try. So education customers are using AWS for, for virtually any workload. Some of the most prominent ones include development and test environments, big data, storage, backup, disaster recovery, you know, massively online courses and distance learning. And, and one that I really enjoy is the student lab environments using our virtual desktop service. So I just wanted to give you a brief overview here uh, about uh, how AWS is transforming education in the cloud. But now I'd like you to hear from a, a number of our AWS customers that are taking this, this powerful platform and really making changes in how educators are teaching and researching and how students are learning. So next, I'd like to, to welcome up Derek, the Senior Director of Cloud Services from the University of Arizona to share his institution's journey to the cloud. Thanks. Thanks, Curtis. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, my name's Derek Masseth, as Curtis said, uh, Senior Director for Cloud Services at, at the University of Arizona. Just here to, to talk to you a little bit today about our, uh, our journey to the cloud, things we've realized along the way, uh, some successes we've had, and, uh, and where, we're, where we're headed. So um, quickly, a little brief about the University of Arizona. I was, I was remarking in the hallway that I wish I wish the U of A was a more household name, kind of like Duke at this point, but um, we got knocked out a little bit early a couple weeks ago. So um, anyway, pretty large Research One traditional land-grant institution uh, out of Tucson, Arizona, serving about 40,000 students uh, with 300 and some odd degree programs, $2 million budget, uh, a bunch of buildings, and it's basically a big footprint, very traditional, um, you know, state uh, higher ed institution with all of the challenges that go along with being one of those and all of the, all of the rewards as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, about cloud and the promise of cloud at the, at the higher ed crossroads that we're at right now, right? So you can't be in higher ed, you can't read higher ed, um, you know, marketing, you can't read a, um, you know, press about higher ed and the dilemmas we're facing right now without hearing about how higher education needs to be more responsive, needs to provide more demonstrable value, needs to be more accessible through global reach, needs to do everything we can to drive cost out of our delivery, um, and needs to be accessible, right? You, you, can't, you can't be in higher ed and not hear those messages. Well, as luck would have it, um, cloud enables many things that are directly responsive to all of those challenges, right? Cloud brings agility in, in forms that were not available, uh, aren't available in traditional IT you know, delivery mechanisms. It's incredibly flexible delivering value. Um, it can deliver a global presence to an institution like the U of A. We've only ever been in Tucson, right? We do a little bit in Phoenix. We're the, we're the land grant, so we're technically in every county, but, but we, global audiences were unavailable to us. We live in Tucson. Um, and cost savings is just kind of built in. And uh, uh, the elasticity of the cloud makes us ultra accessible um, in ways that we don't have to pay for up front. You know, when we have a degree program online that's super popular, we don't have to worry about pre-purchasing capital equipment to, to meet that demand, right? So 
all of those factors lead to a situation where cloud is a no-brainer. Cloud is a no-brainer for the U of A. Cloud should be a no-brainer for all of higher ed, if you ask me. So um, we began our journey uh, with, I would say, some fits and starts, our journey to the cloud, if you will, uh, some time ago, along with many other higher ed institutions, you know, getting email out to the cloud, thinking about what's commodity, how can we get other people to do this, this stuff that um, doesn't differentiate. We did that. We, um, we did some experimentation uh, with faculty and staff email. We tried some private cloud stuff. Um, one thing I want to talk about or focus on a little bit in this journey is early on our focus around these projects were focused on them as technology projects, just another technology project, and did not, I would say, uh, apply enough emphasis to the notion that cloud is fundamentally transformative of all of IT. It's, it's, it's a brand new service delivery mechanism for how we deliver IT, as, uh, IT services, most of them as a service, right? And um, that has a tremendous impact on the person that delivers those things, the IT practitioner, right? And, um, and so we struggled as people, just as practitioners. And, because we were trying to apply all of our old traditional methodologies to what is fundamentally a brand new paradigm. Uh, so we began to shift our focus recently from a, from a technological focus to one that's more, more people focused. And at one point during, during our journey, my boss at the time came to me and said, Derek, I want you to write an infrastructure as a service RFP so we can speed up this cloud transformation. And I laughed at him and I said, I said, nobody's ever written an RFP or done an RFP to speed anything up. Those things just slow things down. But what he was trying to do was build a community and get people talking, get people talking about a document that articulates things that we need and want. And lo and behold, that's actually what happened. We went through the process. We established a contract with AWS, starts building interest. We, we established training programs. Anyway, we built a community of people around getting to the cloud and around the promise in IT for transforming not just the university but our very careers, right? Once that focus began to shift, people began to start seeing their place in the cloud, our momentum picked up dramatically. Um, that's our journey in a nutshell, actually. Um, so what are we doing in the cloud? What are we doing now? What are we planning to do. A couple of examples I wanted to talk about because we're talking about transforming education um, in the cloud are a couple of things that we're doing actively in classrooms that have enabled our faculty to think differently. Uh, it may be mild, but I think you got to take some baby steps before you can take some leaps. So um, we have an, uh, a GIS instruction program. We instruct on ArcGIS. Um, and in previous to our AWS experience, every student had to build their own environment. And they had to find a place to do that. They had to, we had to get it provisioned. In some cases, we had a lot of capital equipment on-prem to, to support those efforts. Um, and students had to go through the process of building before they could ever begin learning how to use ArcGIS. With AWS, we don't have to have any of that capital equipment. We can script the build of ArcGIS. It just happens as soon as the students need it, and momentarily they're learning ArcGIS. They're not learning how to build the environment because they'll never have to know. They're just learning how to use the tool that they're going to use in their professional lives. So anyway, um, that was, I mean, I think we got probably two weeks back in the syllabus in that course alone just by taking the build process and the learn how to install the tool process out of, out of the instruction. Um, then in our business college, our, our MIS program is leveraging uh, Amazon RDS and EMR, uh, number one program in the country, by the way, um, to perform and to teach all of their big data analytics. All of the analytics taught in the MIS um, uh, program today is now taught in RDS for all the same reasons as the ArcGIS program, right? These students aren't ever going to need to know how to build one of those environments 
why would you bother them with forcing them to build it in their college career? They'll never build it in their private career. So that's how we've transformed our classroom. A couple other things we're, we're doing uh, committed in the cloud. So uh, workspaces, our res life department is pretty heavily uh, virtual desktops and they're experimenting with workspaces, likely to go there. We're moving all of our websites to Acquia, which is hosted on AWS. Uh, excited to announce that we are moving our grants management ERP system into production on AWS the 27th of this month. Um, that will be our first major production application in the cloud. So we're doing a whole bunch of disaster recovery, a whole bunch of backups, lots of data. In particular, our Center for Creative Photography hosts the Ansel Adams uh, archive, the digital archive of every Ansel Adams print. That's protected right now in Glacier. Um, we're, we've committed to moving all of our student information system into the cloud, um, ideally by the end of this calendar year. Uh, those are just some examples. So I'm going to rush through this so the other gentlemen have time. I think I'm, I'm approaching my time. So what's next for us? What's next for us, we have declared very recently a cloud-first strategy at the U of A, which means to us that when we have a problem to solve with IT, the first way we're going to try to solve that problem is in the cloud. Um, whether it's a new application um, to develop or a new service to go out and procure, our preference will be cloud first. We will default back to on-prem deployed if and only if we absolutely have to. Along with that, we have committed to moving uh, all of our ERP systems and um, just about everything that the central IT organization does into the cloud um, in, over the next several years. Haven't committed to a date yet. Um, I'd love to tell you about that date at the next summit. So um, that's, that's, that's it for what I have. I think, um, I think uh, Instructure's next, so thank you for your time. See everybody now. It's a good looking crowd. Um, so I'm very excited to be here this afternoon to talk to you about how Instructure is leveraging Amazon Web Services to disrupt and reshape uh, the online learning experience. So in order to tell you the story, um, we need to kind of go back to 2008. And in fact, the Instructure story starts in a classroom. Not this classroom. Actually, this is the coolest classroom in the world. They have a, Brink, a Frank Zappa quote on the, on the board. But uh, that quote is actually core to our belief, right? Without a deviation from the norm, uh, progress is not possible. And so the story starts in Brigham Young University with two students in a how to be a high tech entrepreneur class. That class was taught by our current CEO, Josh Coates. He himself was a very successful uh, serial entrepreneur. And the two founders of Instructure, Brian and Devlin, were in his class. Uh, and one of the core tenets of his curriculum was, if you want to build a technology that disrupts, if you want to build a company that has a high degree of success or high uh, chance of success, find a technology that you use every day that's indispensable to you that just sucks. And Brian and Devlin didn't have to look very far. Because at Brigham Young University, they had four different LMSs at work. right? These LMSs didn't talk to one another. They were clunky. They were built on, on antiquated technology. They were painful to use. In fact, a number of uh, faculty refused to use any of them because they were so painful. And so Brian and Devlin set about uh, on, a, on a mission to change that. And they built a, uh, a straw man of, an, of the application inside of PowerPoint, had about 250 slides. They jumped in a borrowed Geo Metro and they drove up the West Coast. And they talked to anybody in education that would talk to them. 
And on this product validation tour, as they called it, they spoke with 17 different organizations that all of them said, if you build what you say you're going to build, we're going to buy that. So they came home and sat down with, with Josh, their professor, and said, we think we got something here. And Josh said, yeah, I think you do. You know, 17 organizations out there said that they would buy it. So he took them under, their, under his wing and started introducing them to the local VC crowd. And I think it was on the third meeting uh, where the, the VC representative was, was in the room and said, you know, education isn't sexy, right? We're going to put our money in Twitter or we're going to put it on Facebook. And Josh, exhausted and exacerbated, stood up and said, why are you being so stupid? Why aren't you seeing the value here? The guy looked him dead in the eye and said, if you think they're so damn cool, why don't you give them money? So that's what he did. This is not the actual check. In fact, the actual check is enshrined, hermetically sealed in the sub-basement of instruction with guards and lasers. But this is a forgery. And hopefully I don't go to jail for it. But Brian and Devlin, flush with $50,000 in cash and a lot of optimism, uh, decided that they were going to take on this task of building a better learning management system. And at that time, they had a decision to make. They could either go one way and do what everybody else had done, you know, have an on-prem piece of software that required uh, the school to go buy a bunch of servers and hire a bunch of SAs, systems administrators, and go through a lot of pain, or they could go to the cloud. Now in 2008, Amazon had been in business, and the Amazon Web Services had been around for a little bit, and were, was the leader uh, in the cloud space. So they took that $50,000, and instead of buying a lot of servers, uh, they went and they hired a bunch of uh, UI people, developers, and UX developers, and smart coders, and they set about building a product. And they decided to utilize Amazon Web Services for development and testing and prototyping. I think it's already been mentioned by, uh, by both Curtis and Derek that you know, with Amazon Web Services, you could spin up and spin down environments very quickly and at a low cost. So it allowed them to take that $50,000 seed money and really stretch it. Of course, other checks would follow. But they were already hitting the ground in 2008 and ahead of the game because of the use of Amazon Web Services. Now also, about that same time, mobile devices started to appear. Really smart mobile devices started to appear on the market. Now in 2008, if anybody remembers, uh, the app store for both Android and iPhone were pretty barren as far as when it came to educational software. So no, not many people conceived of the fact that students would want to utilize their mobile devices to engage uh, in educational pursuits. Um, Brian and Devlin, I guess, ha had a little bit of an epiphany in that we started a mobile strategy very early on and uh, made sure that our system had rich APIs and uh, the ability to uh, have a developer community that could go do innovative and creative and sometimes scary things with, with uh, Canvas and uh, now with our corporate learning system, Bridge. So that was the state of technology at the time. Now, next month, um, everybody's going to go out and rush and get one of these, right? Um, but what is going to happen in the next five to 10 years with wearables and education, right? Think about it. We're going to have millions of connected devices uh, all working inside this ecosystem. How the heck? Are we going to make sure that we're performant? And I'm talking about instructor here. How are we going to make sure that we're performant and accessible and available for our, our customers and their users? Well, in order to answer that question, I need to give some numbers, right? We all like numbers here. So we have um, about 1,300 customers right now, representing about 16.5 million users. Um, at peak, we have you know, two, well, 1,700 to about 2,000 instances running. Um, and we have just under, uh, that's an old number actually, I apologize. They're just under two uh, petabytes of data under management. But it's that top number that I really want to delve into. 
So if you are running an on-prem or a managed service LMS today, if you have a peak day, that is a bad day. <laughs> um, and they come, you know, a couple times a year, usually around semester starts, right? And in fact, our peak day was on February 9th of this year at 200, actually about a little after noon mountain time, we had 216,000 concurrent users on the platform at the same time. If I was in a traditional data center or managed hosted system, that would be a very bad day for me indeed because one, we didn't know what was going to happen. We knew it was going to happen, but we didn't know when. Uh, you know, if I had to go out and procure hardware and rack and stack it in the data center, uh, that, was, that would be a very bad day indeed. I'd get a lot of calls that, hey, the system is down, it's slow, uh, you know, what's going on? Why are you guys being stupid? Um, and so with Amazon Web Services, we're able to have that capacity waiting for us, right? Um, it, we get the benefit of Amazon's deep pockets and lots of money from selling books. And, uh, you know, they have a lot of servers just waiting there for us, which is quite awesome. Um, in fact, uh, we, ought, we guarantee contractually a 99.9% .9 availability SLA. Uh, I just checked yesterday, we're actually running four nines. Um, and so we're actually able to beat our SLAs, not by a little bit, but by a lot. So how do we ensure that we don't have bad days, right? Um, in a traditional, again, managed hosted uh, or self-hosted, this is kind of your, your sinus rhythm, as I call it. And if you're trying to build out capacity to uh, meet that demand, you're always going to be late because the peak is going to happen. The thundering herd, as we call it, is going to come upon you. And you're going to have the calls, and suddenly there's going to be POs on your desk to get more hardware because we don't ever want to go through that pain again. And you go install that hardware. Problem is, that peak, that pain, was two weeks ago. And so now you've got all this capital investment that's doing nothing for you until the next peak day. And guess what? The last peak day that we had was not 216,000 users. It was 170,000 users. So how do, you, how do you forecast for that? So at Instructure, we take a little bit of a different approach. We utilize the auto-scaling groups, and we utilize them in a very intelligent fashion. We have a piece of software that we wrote in-house that we, we bolt on top of, of the auto-scale group that allows us to use a predictive algorithm that knows our business and knows what's coming. And so it can very easily uh, predict and scale up uh, the infrastructure to be there. In fact, on that, that peak day, on February 9th, when we had 216,000 users, we didn't have a call. We didn't have anybody with hair on fire. The system just worked. And again, if I'm in a, a traditional self-hosted or managed host, I can't say that, right? Um, we were able to uh, ha meet that demand uh, and, and provide the, our users, uh, I'm sorry, our customers and their users with the same level of performance and accessibility as any other day. It was just any other day for us. So in closing, I'd like to leave you with a couple of things. One, when Brian and Devlin set about changing the face of online learning, um, they had this concept of lifelong learning, right? They believed uh, at the core of their business, at the core of our business, that learning is a lifelong pursuit. And so we have uh, you know, a couple of products. One that's focused on K through 12 and higher education being Canvas. And we just released a corporate learning product called Bridge. And, and the idea there is you can have a student start with Canvas in grade school, carry it on through their higher education. And when they enter into the workforce, there's Bridge waiting for them. And so they have a fairly consistent, uh, continuous education experience. Uh, and we would not be able to provide that type of service in any other way than in the cloud. Um, you, can't, you, know, you can't have consistency when you have on-prem software all over the place. The other thing I'd like to leave you with is that um, we basically owe a lot of our success to the fact that we are an Amazon Web Services. They've been an incredible partner of ours. 
and have watched out, have watched over us uh, uh, almost like a guardian angel uh, and let us know when we're, you know, when new services are coming out. And I don't think there's a service in the catalog that we haven't used. Maybe workstations. Um, but we have tied our, our, uh, our technology very closely in, uh, with Amazon's technology stack, and we have re reaped the, the benefits of it. My name is Wade Billings. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Wade. Um, that's a really interesting story. I'm glad uh, none of the learning management systems suck at, uh, at Stanford. I, it's never a problem where we are. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm at uh, Stanford University, and um, I do, do technology strategy and in, a, in a central IT organization, and I run a, an emerging technologies group. And um, so it's a lot, it's actually a lot to stand up and try to represent something as vast as Stanford and sort of the scope of, of what Stanford is, but I'll give it a shot. So, so you guys all know the story of the, um, the massively open online courses that are all run in-house to hundreds of thousands of, no, you don't know that story because I don't either. They're, they don't exist. And, and so, I mean, they're all, that I know about, were all the, all the MOOCs, um, uh, scaled MOOCs that, that we're talking about, you know, we're, we're talking massively scalable, they're all pretty much born in, in, a, in a cloud deployment fashion. So um, I'm going to talk a lot about the, uh, the deployments at Stanford in, in general terms, but since you've heard a fair amount about, about um, LMS and uh, pedagogical kind of deployments, I'm going to focus sort of the latter part of the talk a little bit more on both research and on IT practice and some of the, some of the implications there. But, but about MOOCs and about LMS, I mean, these, these are areas where um, we, we have gone through uh, evolution of, of looking at uh, MOOCs and kind of what was that going to do to the fundamental nature of how um, higher ed instruction is delivered. And there's definitely still this major conversation about intellectual property and kind of who are we, who are we, who, who's, our, who's our user base, who are we serving, what's the community, and all of that. Um, but one thing, when you're, especially when you're a research institution, a great thing about a MOOC is you get a huge amount of data. You get a huge amount of data about how people are interacting with a learning platform. And so you can take that and you can learn from that and learn better ways to teach. You can, you can find out outcomes in real time on a massive scale that you wouldn't necessarily have gotten with you know, the rarefied group of folks that are actually able to get into a place like Stanford. And so that's a fantastic um, learning benefit as well from the MOOCs that I just wanted to point out. But in terms of scaling, they never would happen if we weren't able to use the cloud fundamentally. And then being able to work on the analytics against that. You know, we turn around and, and obviously do that through the cloud as well. Um, with learning management systems, um, we've definitely been contributing for a number of years in platforms that are some of the traditional learning management system platforms. And, um, and again, what the evolution has gone toward has been the cloud. And it, it hasn't necessarily been directly into the cloud um, by us putting something that we're already running in-house out onto AWS, as an example, but maybe working with a partner, working with a Canvas, with those kinds of platforms that are obviously able to iterate what it is they have in functionality a lot more quickly than some of the traditional, traditional platforms that are out there. That's just a side benefit of the, of the rate of innovation and the way that we can continuously improve with the cloud. So in basic research, um, if you ask a basic researcher, um, and I meet a fair number of them at Stanford, uh, a principal investigator that's doing a lot of uh, numerical uh, modeling and doing a lot of research computing, um, if you ask them whether they want to run their experiments and their modeling on in-house resources, in our research computing data center or in the cloud, they'll just look at you and say, yes. I mean, of course, we want whatever we can get. And because the, if, you, if you think about it, the, the, the quality of a model is most of the time on its ability to represent the dynamic range and the resolution um, that you're trying to, to predict in what is going to happen in a physical event, let's say, you know, whether that's a uh, genomics research project or looking for predicting binding sites in, in, in proteins or thinking of a, a, a seismic event or something like that. So 
so to get the dynamic range and to get the, the level of resolution for a great model, why would you be limited to just what you could get your hands on in an internal data center? That's just, we don't hire the, the, the best researchers on the planet um, to, do, to do research at Stanford to limit them by how much hardware they can, they can buy. It just, see, it just seems like madness when you step back and think about that. So, so in fact, um, when, when it's a steady state workload or things like that where they've got a, some grant money and it makes the right sense for them, they, you know, using some high density uh, cores and we've got a great research computing facility uh, on the campus, a pretty new one in fact, um, we're absolutely gonna saturate that as much as possible. But there are lots of cases where we wanna um, really burst into the cloud and to into basically infinite capacity. And we need to be able to do that as a support organization in IT at a, at a place like Stanford. We need to be able to do that just in, the, in a moment, as soon as the idea comes up. We've gotta be ready for that. And so you know, the alacrity, the ability to respond very happful, happily, cheerfully, for the, for the request that comes in. It's not about the money at that point. Second to market in research is nothing. You do not get published. So, and then capacity obviously takes a lot of forms in, in, in research. That, that could be you know, great gobs of storage uh, for, for a lot of data, for, for uh, all the data streaming out of an instrument or something like that, or image processing. But it could also be you know, how many connections at a, at a moment can you do in a parallelized effort. So, so research has really benefited enormously and is, is just getting going, I, I would think, um, really in, in terms of cloud uh, impact. Um, in, in the, well, in the one just before that, let me. Okay, so in IT practice and infrastructure, um, I don't know how many of you guys were able to go to, to Leo's session just before on uh, DevOps. Fantastic, fantastic guy, great subject. And I've had nice conversations with him about this subject. But th this is a real game changer for us, and that's why I wanted to really spend a, a little bit of time focused on this and talk about sort of our evolution at, at Stanford. Um, so obviously a whole lot of cloud activities, a whole lot of SaaS, a whole lot of uh, infrastructure as a service and platform as well. But you know, sort of narrow in on some specific cases that, that my, I've, I've been involved with directly. Um, University Communications Office at Stanford uh, recognized we had a real exposure in being able to scale um, infinitely, as much as necessary, around emergency notification of events. And so um, we, we obviously you know, said, okay, we've got to do this in the cloud. Now how we ended up doing it in the cloud was, was a real great uh, eye-opener because you can take the training classes, but until you start to do some deployments and then iterate through a couple of gener generations of those deployments, you really don't know the power of what you can do, and you also don't realize until then how the work changes. How, how the nature of the skills change as well. So we do this deployment, we did it on Elastic Beanstalk initially, and we've got sort of this, Word, this WordPress instance over here that just the internal folks that are updating the content, and then we push out the content static out to S3 buckets, fantastic, scales crazy. We, we, uh, we, do, um, we use a load testing tool called Bees with Machine Guns, highly rated, highly, highly recommended, to, to test it out, did a fantastic job scaling, no problem, didn't bat an eye. So that was the first, first sort of deployment that really got noticed. We had done some things here and there, but did that, and then the following year, we did something that was a little bit bigger profile. We did the entire uh, homepage infrastructure and all the content delivery of Stanford University. So that got noticed, and it was, it was sort of a benefit of learning about it, but also putting it on the map relative to all the distributed IT at the university, and it, um, you know, we've got a, a fantastic uh, staff, IT staff in a distributed sense, and, and it was a, a vehicle for a conversation about deployments as well. And so, you know, there's a lot of side benefits that if you're running an IT organization to think about, about how you're change managing these kinds of things too. Um, the, uh, the next one that I wanted to talk to was, was really we recognized we needed a platform, something that we were going to be able to reuse um, at a moment's notice. And this is where the, the real pivot, I think, happened that I wanted to really talk about was the, the, the whole DevOps mentality. So we, we all know that if, if you go into the console of, of, of Amazon and you see all these different products, you realize you've got all these things to learn about and you start playing around with them and learning about them. Um, you, you realize pretty quickly that what you did before and how you did your work before 
seems almost like it seems primitive, right? You were doing things like hand patching things and you were hand rolling things. So you start automating things and you start, instead of using the console all the time, you start using CLI. And then you move forward and use APIs and you really start to automate things. You do things more in a programmatic fashion. And, and that changes the nature of the work and the nature of the skills and the nature of the conversation to become much more of a, of a software development kind of a conversation rather than a traditional, say, sysadmin, DBA, those kinds of roles. It really shifts. And so what's, what's a great um, opening for some of your IT staff that wouldn't otherwise have necessarily been embracing the cloud is that when you start putting tools in front of them that look like the tools that they use anyway, that they've been hearing about and, and knowing in, in certain software engineering uh, uh, changes that have been going on anyway, what they know what continuous uh, in, uh, in a, a continuous improvement is about. They understand why these things are, 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 are trends that, that they can capture. They also understand that this kind of direction means that they can put their code through testing and go live a lot more quickly. So, so the, the, the first deployment we did with a DevOps model was really taking the original emergency code and moving that forward such that um, it was going through a Jenkins model. So that's the framework we're using for continuous integration. So, so that really, really uh, excited the, 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 uh, the university communications office, and they wanted more of that. And we were able to then demonstrate to broader audiences the value of that. Now, what we've layered on more recently is containerization. So containers is a, are another huge game changer that have applicability to a whole lot of other parts of, of the university and how we're working. So, I would say that, so this is our mix. This is our stone soup mix of the different products. You know, we've got Git, we've got, um, we've got um, uh, uh, you know, CoreOS and Docker and Jenkins. And, you know, you can insert, insert different kinds of tools, different kinds of, of, of utilities in, in, in the mix here with, very, uh, with uh, you know, Vagrant as well. So I would say that, that, that all, while those logos are going to be changing probably quite a bit over the next three to five years. I think the model of continuous uh, integration and doing things in a container model is really something that's got staying power. And so we're heavily investing in that strategy. And so we've gotten a huge amount of benefits in terms of, of our you know, upgrades without service dis disruption, you know, really, really being able to port, make portable the stacks that we move between. Now this is actually really exciting for a lot of our researchers because if you've ever supported basic researchers and they have to change from one platform to another and if their executable environments and their libraries and their analytical um, tools fundamentally change and they get different round off errors on you know, things, that drives them crazy. And when they have to redo that, uh, the portability that developers like around containerization is something that researchers really, really like a lot. Um, I would say that the, the scripting that you, that you think about with cloud formation, that's an awesome uh, uh, set of frameworks to be able to script uh, like a whole data center creation. Uh, we, we're using a tool called Terraform. To abstract that out a little bit, we're driving uh, cloud formation, but we're doing it with an external tool so we actually have the ability to script the same kind of build mechanisms for internal platforms as well. And then um, in terms of rapid deployment, I mean, this is one of these sort of the red queen effect situations that, that what's acceptable um, today in terms of rollout pace is just not gonna be acceptable uh, next year. So we've gotta keep trying to, to shorten our windows of being able to roll things out, request comes in. Uh, we've gotta be able to turn that on right away, turn that, that request in around right away, or even better, allow the consumers to request and have an automated script just deliver it for them automatically. And that's, that's anywhere from a, from a central IT, a, 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 a business analyst, all the way through to a researcher or someone who's teaching a class. So it's really the whole gamut of, of IT. So I would say the platform is fundamentally changing. The way we're thinking about the platform, it's not just about infrastructure as a service, it's all the orchestration, it's all the security, it's all of that. The skills and the work fundamentally changing, and this is the big change, the cultural change that I probably spend most of my time with, to be honest with you, 
and that's uh, the, the technical IT staff. That's folks that now have to realize that they've got a big dimension of vendor management they have to think about and compliance, all those kinds of things. But it's, it's absolutely a lot more work. It's just a different kind of work, I would say. A lot less drudgery and a lot more automation. And I just see nothing but possibilities. I mean, I see, you know, every time I, every day I come into work, I see more things that we can drive forward and more, more um, turnaround, we're more satisfied folks that we, that we can go after. And so uh, the cloud is just a huge part of that. I, don't, I can't even imagine a way we would be able to do that without the cloud. And, and our go-to platform right now is really AWS. So that's, uh, that's what I had to go over. All right, well, thank you, uh, Derek, Wade, and Bruce. Really appreciate you sharing those stories. And I think this is, these are great examples, right, of how AWS is really transforming education. And I really appreciate sharing with, with the audience today. So within, uh, within your mobile app, you'll, you'll see within this session, there's a, a survey at the bottom. We, we always appreciate uh, feedback um, on, the, on the sessions that helps us um, plan content for future, future events like this. So I believe we have a, a few minutes also. We can, uh, we're, we'll be up here, we can take some questions. Um, we may have a mic um, that we'll, we can move around <laughs> the room. No, we don't? Okay, we don't. All right, so we will be up here, we, and uh, afterwards we'll actually be, out, actually be outside in the, in the hallway as well um, if you have questions. So feel free to, to uh, come up and, and ask us anything. Sure. Uh, I'll, so, so at Stanford, we um, probably over the last, I think we started about two or three, three years ago probably, doing training. And initially we did uh, a training class on site. Um, there was pretty much only one option that looked like it was a fit, was the, um, was the architecting for, with AWS um, option. And it was a pretty decent fit. I mean, it was kind of a survey course. If you can imagine the, the amount of new products that, and services that AWS has come out with in the last nine years or whatever, they're, they're still jamming it into the same two and a half, three day course, and it's pretty tough to actually. But we, we did get, you do get good hands-on time, great um, quality uh, instructors. We had, we had solutions architects, they've moved forward with uh, having, I think, uh, professional trainers coming in now. There's, there's, it's really good content. We got a lot of value out of it, but we really had to ramp it up. And so while the first wave of uh, 15, I think, uh, folks that we had go through the training was great. It was even better when we got up to about 65 or 70 or something like that, because really there was a tipping point where we were getting a lot more of the distributed IT folks involved in the training, which is a great way to kind of get a, a baseline of understanding much higher when you're going into a conversation. Because it's not like a place like Stanford and Central IT runs everything. There's a whole lot of distributed IT. In fact, there's a lot more distributed IT than there is in the center. And, and so um, I think it's been a great, a great value in terms of the investment. We liked the fact that we did a lot of it in-house. Most of it was we did in, on campus. Um, there has since been uh, new variations of the, of the training. I haven't lined any of that up, though. I, need, I should get around to doing that, because I think it's probably a lot more differentiated for some of your different uh, staff. Um, yeah, that's sort of the story so far at, at Stanford. So for Instructor, uh, you know, we've had in-house as well as uh, virtual training for all of our staff. Uh, we also attend uh, reInvent religiously and uh, go to the, the sessions and watch the online sessions. Uh, but I think for the most part for us, uh, what's really effective is just having the ability to go in there and play with things and break things and uh, do so in a very safe and sane way, right? So we're not working with production uh, workloads or production environments, but they're able to clone those environments and uh, give our, our uh, engineers and our dev people, uh, I'm sorry, our ops people an opportunity to go in and work with new technologies and their new services that come out and uh, really get, the, get their hands dirty. Yeah, so at the University of Arizona, we, um, we 
the training has actually been a fairly, fairly uh, significant portion of our focus uh, as we think about building, building a community around cloud. So we have, um, over the course of the last year, uh, we, we started with on-site delivered um, to 20 seats, uh, the architecting course, the three-day architecting on AWS course. And we were, very, we were very strategic about how we laid out those first three sessions, right? So our first session, you actually had to apply and you had to come with a pilot project you were committed to trying. So we were kind of, we were kind of looking for those, those early adopters, those folks that are gonna kind of look for the edge of the envelope and be willing to jump off of it with us, right? And so we, um, we made 10 seats available to central IT and 10, seat, 10 of the 20 available to campus IT. And then, you know, thereby kind of building that community during that three days of training, right? And in the next round, we very explicitly targeted only IT directors. Um, and again, split evenly between central and, and distributed IT. So to begin building the community, to begin kind of planting those seeds of thought at the decision maker layer. And then in the third round, we went back to a, to a more kind of individual contributor focus, um, um, you know, kind of targeted, and again, another 20 seats. That round was challenging because the demand for it, the desire for it, after the first two sessions was insatiable. We had 20 seats, we had 60 people that wanted it. So we delivered it, we picked 20, it was hard, and um, decided in that process that we needed to do something that was dramatically more scalable then, because per head, the delivery cost of that training model was just not gonna be sustainable. We have 800 IT staff on campus. So, uh, we partnered actually with AWS to develop, to kind of condense that three day down into one and deliver it on-prem with, with um, I would say more economical, maybe uh, more focused resources. We partner with, with AWS to do that. And um, we deliver that, the relevant content from the three day in a one day session and we don't limit the number of people that can come. So we delivered to 41 in the first round, we delivered to almost 20 in the second round. We've got our third round planned already uh, with, with you know, 15, 20 people already signed up. We don't even have a date yet. So um, training, and that, that, it's been nice to get people into the interface, to get people looking at it, kicking the tires in a way where they're not creating financial risk. Everybody thinks, or a lot of people, before they ever get into the interface, they think it, that they can rack up a bill that's just a mile wide that they can't pay or that their management will be upset with them for having created, right? So giving them the opportunity to get into the interface, to do some simple little things so that they're not intimidated when they actually go in and begin to provision resources and recognize that, that the risk is small, you know? These are people that when they make a mistake in their day job today, it can cost thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars. And um, you know you over provision or make a, a simple mistake in AWS, and generally it's measured in pennies or, or nickels or dollars, but not tens or twenties or thousands of them. So that it's been eye opening, and it's it's been effective to to build skill and to build community uh, and to drive the fear factor down. So it's been good. Great. Great. I think yeah, there was a question there. Um, you know, I, I personally believe that the vast um, majority of the value that we're going to realize at the University of Arizona is, is more around responsiveness to our community, right? Be able, be the, our, our ability to deliver features and functionality faster is really what we're looking for. Um, we're measuring for cost savings. We're looking for those opportunities to say that we saved cost or drove capital out and, and, um, and, and moved a lot of things to the operational side of the ledger. We're on track right now to um, our capital spend this year in central IT is 50% what it was at this point last year. So we're fairly confident that we're going to close the books this year having spent you know, five million less in capital than we did last year. That would be going from nine to four. 
So that'll be tangible if it actually kind of comes to pass. It really feels like it's going to. That might be the most tangible we have right now. budget headcount for cloud migration. Um, you know, we've mostly focused on transitioning folks into new skill sets or into new areas, and so haven't honestly forecast uh, dramatic impact on, on headcount. Uh, absolutely forecast a dramatic impact on, on skills needed in the new world versus the, the old world. Is that what, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, so we're not forecasting. Yeah, and honestly, our preference right now would be to skill up the people we have um, as opposed to, to kind of think about a swap. Um, so ask me next year if, you know, how well that works out, I suppose. But we're not, we're not, we don't have dramatic forecasts around headcount right now either. You know, we see a dramatic need to shift. Uh, and we're talking about that fairly openly, um, but not a dramatic forecast around headcount, you know, number transition. I, I would I, like to add one thing to what you just said is that, uh, you know, for, for all of you guys who are, um, who are managing staff and sort of managing these transitions, uh, whether you can do it through metrics or other ways to, to sort of watch the transition, the reality is, is that there are, there are going to be people that are standout um, folks that really get why this is important and do some work on their own. And it's not a surprise. I mean, there's a lot of folks that, you know, day to day sort of get stuck in a rut anyway. It didn't have to take cloud to, to happen. It could have been some other disruptive technology. But, but there is definitely a fundamental change in the nature of work for folks like system administrators and database administrators and the folks that that do the traditional, you know, but even, even process focused around ITIL and things like that. There's, 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 a, there's a change of how that all is accomplished in, in the cloud. And it doesn't mean that, for instance, ITIL processes go away, but a lot of them can be automated. And you want to look for folks that are looking for automation everywhere they can find it. And so those people aren't necessarily cheap, but they are they, they reap enormous benefits in terms of your ability to execute fast and for looking for opportunity uh, for, for savings of, through automation. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, who wants to be in a career path where you're, you're basically doing something that a script could do? I mean, really, you want to really point your, you want to you cultivate your staff and give them opportunities to grow with these trends that we're talking about. But they've got to want it. Yeah. And you've got to have a way to track that. Agreed. Okay, I think we are at time today. So again, thank you everybody for, for joining us. Thanks. Thanks.